Good morning, Southwest Meat Association. My name's Rick Kimbrell, CEO of Start Clean Legacy, LLC. We provide contract cleaning services, detergents, and sanitizers to dozens of SMA members. I'd like to take a moment to thank our team, 400 strong here in the Southwest. For the last six months, they've been working harder than ever, just like the men and women in your plants. Without them, we wouldn't be able to serve the food industry. Our team, like yours, has continued to keep grocery store shelves full and stocked, and we're proud of that. StarClean's honored to be the sponsor of the 64th Annual SMA Convention. I'm so glad we were able to at least meet in, in this format. The last time I missed an SMA convention was in 1987, the Orlando Convention, when my father, Ray Kimbrell, he either couldn't or wouldn't fork over the money to take us to Florida. I'm thankful that my roots and our Start Clean family roots go back with SMA, about as long as this old classic's been on the road. This is the best job I've ever had. Every day we get to build the culture and have the opportunity to create the best job that you've ever had for so many people, helping build careers that coexist with a healthy work-life balance. To do this, we've created the Start Clean Wins Leadership Training Program. This program is mentoring and training all of our existing and future sanitation managers, coaching them to be prepared, consistent, confident, and to follow through as they help manage your food safety. If you see someone walking through your plant with one of these on, stop and encourage them. Again, StartClean commends all SMA members for their role in putting safe food on the table. The food industry will always be essential. We're proud to be a part of it. I know you are too. Work hard. Our next presenter has been conducting focus groups on the effectiveness of FSIS outreach to small meat processors. Rebecca Thistlethwaite is the director of the Niche Meat Processor Assistant Network. She previously served three years as the program manager for the same organization. She has a master's degree in international agricultural development from the University of California, Davis, and was formerly co-owner of TLC Ranch, a mid-scale organic pastured poultry and livestock enterprise in California. She is author of two books on farming, Farms with a Future, Creating and Growing a Sustainable Farm Business, and The New Livestock Farmer, The Business of Raising and Selling Ethical Meat, she also provides business and marketing consulting for sustainable farms and food businesses. We especially appreciate Rebecca waking up really early this morning to be with us as she resides in Oregon, which is a couple of hours earlier than us. Rebecca, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, I think today was the first day I've set my alarm in like three months since COVID hit. So <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm going to start off by sharing my screen. So I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint here. And let's see. Is it all good? Excellent. Okay. So uh, this presentation is gonna be a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna share a couple dozen slides and then I'm gonna ask for your feedback. So uh, this is uh, the first time I've, I've conducted a virtual focus group. So. Uh, it should be interesting, but um, this presentation is really catered towards uh, small and very small plants because that is the purpose of the study. So I'll get started and let you know a little background about, um, about the study. So uh, for the first 15 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce the study and the draft findings, and then we're going to have a big group discussion. Um, if for some reason, you know, you don't you don't want to um, make your comments or questions uh, available here in the public and you want to just contact me directly. Um, there's my phone number and email. And also, if you want to spend some time reading the 30 page uh, first draft of the small plant study, there is a link right there on that slide that you can copy down 
and you can find it on our website. All right, moving on. So just a brief background in the 2018 Farm Bill, I'm gonna minimize my video here. All right, the 2018 Farm Bill authorized that a university or college conduct a review of the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service with regards to the following aspects. So they wanted uh, someone to take a look at the effectiveness of the outreach conducted by FSIS, the effectiveness of the guidance materials and other tools, and the responsiveness of FSIS personnel to inquiries and issues from small and very small establishments. So in 2019, Oregon State University, which is uh, the sponsor, sponsor university of my uh, extension program, um, the, we, we submitted a proposal to conduct the study and we were chosen to, uh, to write the study. So we're, we're about two thirds of our way through that process. Um, first, we wrote a first draft and we've spent the last three months getting feedback from key stakeholder groups on that first draft. And then uh, starting next month, we're gonna incorporate all of that feedback on the first draft to develop our final draft, which we will then submit to FSIS uh, at the end of the year. So today, I would love your feedback on what we found so far. Um, so as I said, that we're looking at three sort of um, key areas of work of FSIS with regard to how they treat small and very small establishments. So the first one is outreach. So FSIS employs a variety of methods to conduct outreach, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of these methods. Um, there, of course, there's direct outreach from implant inspection staff, circuit staff, and their district offices. Um, there also is a, a new um, EI, EIAO outreach effort uh, where 25% of their time is spent in outreach, and that program is about two years old. There's the FSIS website, the Small Plant Help Desk, the Ask FSIS web portal, and then there's also constituent meetings and roundtables around the US. And I have um, um, been fortunate to attend about six of those roundtables, the last one being in Texas in February, where I met um, Joe and others from SMA. All right. So our key recommendations thus far for outreach to improve their outreach efforts are there needs to be more congruence between what Ask FSIS says and what implant personnel say and interpret. Uh, clarity should always be the focus and responsibility of FSIS staff. There needs to be more clarity on the role of Ask FSIS and the small plant help desk which ones should processors call on, which ones provide a definitive answer to questions, and perhaps create more of a one-stop shop for small operators instead of having these different entities. There seems to be little processor knowledge of FSIS outreach resources, and this is based on uh, their own survey data, um, such as webinars, compliance guides, website resources, et cetera. When new plants are applying for a grant of inspection, they should be made aware of all the resources. Additionally, implant personnel could download relevant compliance guides and highlight key points that they think plant operators should be aware of. More recommendations are that FSIS website is still incredibly complex and hard to navigate. I know they've put a lot of effort into improving their website over the last few years, but um, Google still provides a better search engine than their website to find stuff on their website. So a plain language review and outside website design assistance could provide useful. Um, the website also has very limited resources on it in Spanish, despite the fact that many plant operators and employees are Spanish speakers. If FSIS is going to organize their own small plant roundtable meetings, they need to do a better job of inviting nearby small and very small plants and gearing the agenda around their needs. They should listen more than speak. They also need to go visit small plants and tour them when they are in those regions. It's critical for them to see and experience the scale and complexity of these small establishments, many of which are processing you know, multiple species. 
Uh, as well, FSIA should advertise their EIAO outreach program more thoroughly and make it clear to constituents that it's not an assessment or enforcement tool, but rather information seeking and technical assistance oriented. EIAOs should develop a SharePoint folder to disseminate tools, tips, best practices that they have learned in doing small plant outreach over the last couple of years, and more communication between staff across districts could improve their results. More opportunities for FSIS staff, especially their EIAOs, to attend relevant meat processor conventions, conferences, and gatherings. They could set up booths and trade shows and disseminate more information and outreach directly to processors. And this could help build rapport and trust with face-to-face -face contact. Um, I will say, you know, every time we've had one of these uh, stakeholder roundtables in different parts of the country and small plants get to meet, the top FSIS leadership, it just dramatically improves the rapport and the trust. Um, so the second area that we looked at was the effectiveness of the guidance materials and other information tools. So FSIS guidance documents are non-regulatory in nature, but they seek to provide the current understanding of best practices to comply with FSIS regulations and maintain a safe meat supply. Other information tools that FSIS employs includes their website, offering webinars, publishing newsletters, reports and documents, and answering questions via their small plant help desk and, at, and their online Ask FSIS portal. There's obviously some overlap between this and outreach. So our key recommendations so far are that they develop more visual aids, infographics, and flowcharts, decision trees, just to make their information more accessible and less wordy. Uh, more Spanish publications and resources. Um, put model HACCP plans back on the website. Uh, create a searchable archive of all peer-reviewed validation studies for different meat products and also include an archive of appro appropriate support documents for robust systematic humane handling plans. Uh, currently, processors have to contact universities and track down peer-reviewed papers that are behind paywalls to find a lot of these studies, and um, processors would like those studies to be made more available. Uh, also, how-to guides, how to get a grant of inspection, how to get your HACCP plan approved, how to pass a FSA, how to write a robust humane handling plan, how to determine animal consciousness and stunning effectiveness, et cetera. And then more communication with state inspection programs, uh, provide them all the same outreach and information tools. Make sure those tools are getting to the state inspected at least equal to plants. Okay, and the third bucket we looked at was the responsiveness of FSIS personnel to inquiries and issues from small and very small establishments. So this is how well does FSIS respond to inquiries, issues, petitions, phone calls, meeting recommendations, labeling disputes or delays, and other concerns. Also enforcement actions such as regulatory control, withholdings, and suspensions. All right, oops. Pulled up the questions and now I can't get rid of them. Can, um, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so our key recommendations in this area of work is to allocate funds and staff to create an FSIS Ombudsman Office to help resolve and adjudicate small plant issues and concerns such as inspector retaliation, humane handling violations, product recalls, overtime charges, et cetera. Provide a binding means for expert interpretation of the regulations. Also, more accountability and oversight for rogue inspectors that are communicating inaccuracies or making up their own policies and interpretations of policies. FSIS Office of Field Operations should study inspection decisions and enforcement actions across circuits and districts to correlate and calibrate inconsistencies and flag potential biases or staff problems. Take seriously the most notable personnel problems. I think I skipped a slide. Let's see if I can go back to it. Also, uh, 
quite, quite a bit about humane handling here. If a misdone is not egregious and simply human error, and if the plant has a robust plan in effect, allow the plant to be able to finish up animals slotted for the day and address any problems after inspection hours. More standardized and ongoing education and training for all inspection personnel, including training in plants of all sizes and all species. And then uh, little research is being done on how small and very small poultry plants can meet salmonella performance standards. Uh, we heard this quite a bit over the last year. FSIS could allocate funds towards research in this arena and convene research teams as they have done with other studies. All right, I think just a couple more recommendations. Uh, partner with USDA AMS to verify label claims remove all label claims that cannot be verified, such as healthy and natural, and then create a monthly conference call specifically for small and very small plants to talk with FSIS leadership, hear about the latest policies and guidance documents that may affect them, and other Q&A is needed, provide a system for plants to submit questions or agenda items beforehand, and market and promote this conference call to all small and very small establishments. So as part of our first draft of this report, uh, we, we have a case study in it uh, related to humane handling because this was an issue of special concern in that last bucket. Um, so we kind of took a deeper dive into humane handling as that's an issue that's been brought up at lots of these stakeholder meetings. So I think you'll find this information kind of interesting. Um, so USDA inspected small and very small establishments in the US suffer from a disproportionately higher rate of humane handling violations from warnings through complete suspensions than larger plants. In analyzing data from 2007 through the end of 2019 from the Animal Welfare Institute who obtained their data from quarterly enforcement reports, 98.2% of all humane handling suspensions were received by small and very small plants. In 2019 alone, not a single large plant received a humane handling suspension. 100% of the suspensions were incurred by small and very small plants. And here it is graphed out. Um, you'll see that large plants is that green line at the bottom, uh, small plants is the red, and very small is the blue. Not really sure what happened in 2015. Uh, Al Almanza could probably talk about that year, but uh, they were uh, really vigilant on small, very small plants that year. Uh, also, the length of humane handling suspensions by plant vary by size. Um, so the other concern this data points out is the number of days in suspension. Large plants are more likely to be suspended for one day or less, meaning they are back up and running under inspection swiftly. The graph below shows the range and median number of days by plant size over time. Small and very small plants are more likely to be suspended for longer than large plants, with three days being the median for a very small plant, while one day is the median for large plants. Over this time period of 2007 to 2019, the longest a very small plant was shut down was 292 days, while only nine days for a large plant. So our humane handling recommendations so far is that FSIS should expand guides, online tools, trainings, outreach, education, and technical assistance to assure small and very small plants are able to adopt and maintain a robust systematic approach. FSIS should assess whether or not the robust systematic approach is applicable to small and very small and multi-species plant as it's currently written and if there are areas where it should be revised or where additions should be made to assure it's applicable. Um, FSI should ensure both inspection personnel and plant operations have a clear understanding of when a suspension will not occur for an establishment who has a robust systematic approach so that that clarity uh, needs to be more clear. <laughs> and that FSIS's current protocols should include a timeline for suspension based on certain factors. So uh, processors can see a published timeline to know what they're in for. All right, so here's the chance for you all to give me feedback. Um, I would prefer the feedback come from small and very small plants, but I don't mind if others um, on this call provide feedback as well. 
Um, so my first question to you is based on the draft report conclusions so far, do you have any other specific recommendations for FSIS to improve the effectiveness of their outreach, guidance materials, and other tools? So if you have any ideas, uh, feel free to pop them in. I think we're using the Q&A, not a chat box. So go ahead and pop them in the Q&A, and then I will write them down and um, maybe respond to your ideas. So based on what you've heard, are there any other um, specific recommendations for FSIS to improve the effectiveness of their outreach, guidance materials, and other tools? Any thoughts? Don't be shy. <laughs> There's 103 of you on the call, so I'm sure some of you have some ideas. I'll give it a, a minute. Virtual roundtables, awesome. Yeah, just like we're doing right now. It's definitely cheaper than flying places too. Save some taxpayer dollars. Um, it's hard to have outreach with EIAO because we haven't had clarity of where this is documented and how it will not come back to harm the establishment. Yeah, I've, I've heard that quite a bit that processors are a little uh, wary of having outreach by EIAO. So uh, that's a good one. Thank you, Denise. Any other ideas? Okay, uh, okay, I'm not able to type into the question and answer box, so you're going to have to hear from me directly. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. The, pertinent to the, to the last question, we've, we have gotten that feedback a lot that we know that EIOs are committed to spending a certain portion of their time doing outreach. Uh, yeah. But as a processor, a lot of times it's hard, it's hard, hard to know, is this, is this outreach or is this regulation? Uh, yep. when, when they're having those meetings. And so I think that is a, a very pertinent point to, to address. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and if s small plants are hesitant to ask for support or advice from EIAO, then they won't, they won't call them. They won't engage with them. And, uh, and then that program you know, is less effective. So thank you. Any other thoughts before I move on to the next question? Any and all ideas are welcome. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next one. You guys are doing great. Um, is there anything missing from this report or, or the summary that I provided you uh, that you think should be added? Any other key issues that aren't discussed or potential recommendations or solutions? So did we, did, did, it, did I overlook any sort of glaring issues in outreach, information tools, and uh, effectiveness to small plant issues. Pop it in the Q&A. Oh, I got a few more things in here. There are times with the, with the frontline supervisors are difficult to connect with that we simply just go to the district office. Yes, that comes up quite a bit. People moving up the command chain often because they're not getting, um, they're, they're not getting the support they need from the implant staff. And then you can correlate the number of NRs issued to a plant by one specific inspector versus another inspector. Yeah, so correlation across inspectors, across circuit, across districts I think is is really important. I'm not sure if that's done, but um, I haven't found evidence of that. So any more ideas on question number two? Writing down my notes here. All right. Oh, there's a few more down here, sorry. <laughs> okay, Abby said, I jumped in late, so I apologize if this was discussed. However, my recommendation is if there is not proprietary information being asked with Ask FSIS, these answers need to be visible and more easily searchable than the current method. Yeah, so the Ask FSIS staff 
uh, go through the questions and the answers, and then they pull out ones to add to their website uh, that they feel like don't have proprietary business information, so more of the kind of generic questions. But a, a, a large number of the questions they receive never make it on to their archive. Um, so I will write that down and um, let them know that you'd like to see more of those questions because it is a, it is a real treasure trove of, of answers that, that processes are looking for. Um, and then Denise, again, ask FSIS becomes the mediator in some instances. Yeah. And a processor can always ask for a conference call between their implant um, inspector and an Ask FSIS staff person. And you can have a three-way call where you try to come up with more of a definitive answer. But yeah, there is often conflict between um, what the implant staff say and what you get from Ask FSIS. And that, that is definitely a problem. Rebecca, this is Jason Byer. Um, I would recommend too that, that whenever the FSI sends their inspectors off to get trained and, and, and they go to some sort of training, uh, that those inspectors come back and, and tell us what they, they learned and tell us what they're going to be looking for because now they, they just come back and they got some new pet peeves and it takes us, you know, a long time to figure out what, you know, What's this new thing you just learned because you, you know you've never mentioned it before but yeah so when they when they get trained and they come back with new information they um they want you to make changes in your plant is that what you're suggesting well, typically no they just write in ours until you make the change but <laughs> i would like them to uh, give us their feedback and tell you know come tell us what they learned okay maybe give you a heads up <laughs> yeah yeah, and, and a lot of processors also mentioned having access to more of these trainings, you know, for example, you know, inspectors get trained in humane handling and um, stunning effectiveness and signs of consciousness. And I've been told in previous FSIS meetings that they were going to make that th those trainings available to processors too, so that people were getting the same set of information. But to my knowledge, that information, that those trainings are still not available to processors. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. And, oh, wait, there's more. Sorry. <laughs> we have experienced inspectors that reject our NR responses simply because of their opinion. So what is a plant to do? We get pressured to respond so the inspector can close the NR. Mm -hmm. And then the, FS, the PHIS system is not user-friendly. Not all NRs show up on PHIS. We've had this happen a few times. Okay, Oops. I haven't heard that one before, but I will write that down. <clears throat> okay, and moving on to the next question. Okay. Given what you have heard in the draft report about FSIS outreach strategies and practices, how, effect, how effective have you found them to be in addressing your needs, questions, or concerns? So this is more about your personal experience with outreach um, strategies and practices. Have you found them to be <laughs> effective in addressing your needs, questions, or concerns? I know we've talked about a few of them already. Um, is there anything else? that you want to mention. We've got a couple more minutes and you're doing great. All right, any other? Okay, there we go. Making sure I am not missing any. Um, there's so much variation across districts. Yeah, um, we have heard that quite a bit. And that's also why correlation studies should be done across districts to see if there is variation and why and what can be done about that. Because it's not really fair that some processors enjoy um, very helpful districts offices and others 
don't get to enjoy the same treatment. <laughs> All right. I think that's my last question. No, I have two more. Um, again, based on the draft report, do you have any specific recommendations for FSIS to be more responsive to inquiries or issues that you have? How could they be more responsive? Feel free to type it in the Q&A. I don't see any more. Okay, if you think of something, you can always contact me later too. And then finally, this is my last question for y'all. Uh, what do you make of the humane handling findings that I shared and the recommendations? Do they, do you think if, if you slaughter, obviously this doesn't apply to people who don't slaughter, do you think they would address your concerns if they implemented those recommendations? Any thoughts? on the humane handling data that I shared and the recommendations? Yeah, I don't think they would hurt if they uh, followed <laughs> the recommendations. Um, I think uh, uh, a lot of this is one-on-one, -on -one, you know, situations and, and very time sensitive. Uh, it's not like you can go back and look at it, but, um, but yeah, I think it wouldn't hurt. Uh, I don't think it would, uh, it, it would be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, folks? All right, well, I actually ended like pretty much on time. <laughs> so, um, help get you guys back on schedule. So, I really appreciate um, your time, everybody. And again, if you, if you have ever other thoughts about the draft, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, give me a phone call or send me an email and then uh, look for the final draft coming out later on this year. Um, we are submitting it to FSIS, but hopefully they will make it public. Not so sure about that. Um, <laughs> and hopefully they will implement all the recommendations that you all helped us develop. So thank you so much and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. We enjoyed it. Appreciate you getting up early to be with us this morning. And uh, 